All right. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Android free-to-play mobile game marketing strategy updates for 2024. Um, that's kind of a big mouthful of a title, but if I'm going to talk about the mobile KPIs your game needs to have any traction or success on the current Android uh, marketplace, this is specifically for free-to-play games, not for premium games. The reason I'm putting this video together is because I've been getting a lot of people reaching out to me about a GDC talk I did in 2019 about marketing uh, and the, the core question that I get asked on a regular basis is is it still relevant the things that I discussed in 2019 are they relevant to the current mobile game market in 2024 and the answer is no so I wanted to do a video to not set the record straight but just give an update so let's get started who am I? Uh, <clears throat> I'm Mike Gordon. I'm the former VP of Publishing at Congregate, um, the current CEO of Iron Horse Games. Um, I've spent a lot of money on marketing and user acquisition, so two million on Google Play and about a million on Facebook. That means I know some things about marketing, but not a lot of things. There are plenty of people who spent more money out there. There are people who spent money better than I have. There are people who understand free-to-play games better than I do, but my, um, my goal here is to share the things that I do know, uh, and hopefully they're relevant and helpful to you as you're marketing your game in 2024 and beyond. So what's the current state of play? It's a great question. Um, in 2021, Apple fundamentally changed the landscape uh, for marketing and user acquisition. So when the um, app transparency stuff um, that allows you to not get tracked uh, rolled through, the privacy changes, uh, essentially what happened there is a lot of advertisers moved their budget from Apple to Google. I think, and this is supposition on my side, but having launched a bunch of games in early 2021, my impression of what happened is that uh, Google foresaw a lot of that marketing budget and traffic coming from Apple, and they cut off an enormous number of organic installs that games previously had been receiving. So in 2020, you know, obviously it was COVID, so you're getting a lot of installs, but even prior to that, you could relatively reliably launch a game on the Google Play Store and get a, a large number of organic installs. Uh, I personally saw across a number of games that that spigot was cut off in a, in a pretty pronounced way. This is uh, an image of what <clears throat> installs look like today on a, lot, a number of games that I'm working on. So, this is what it used to look like the the good old days uh, there was a consistent paid to organic ratio so what does that mean um, what it means practically is on google play when you would go and acquire a user uh, google theoretically would detect that you've acquired a user from outside of the platform and they'd give you several organic installs from inside the platform it was a behavior that they wanted to encourage and the way that they encouraged it was to give you organic installs which is pretty cool um, so as you spent over time, you would get organic installs kind of peppered in throughout there. My return on ad spend at the time was heavily calculated um, by the organic installs that you were getting as a result of the marketing spend. One of the, I don't know if it's a truth, but it's something that I saw frequently on the games that I work on and have worked on on the Google Play Store is the idea that users on Google Play are slightly less valuable than uh, users on Apple. What that means in practical effect is when you start running user acquisition campaigns, you'll see that the CPI and the ARPUs or the LTVs of the uh, of the users that you've acquired with that CPI don't match up. Uh, if you don't know what these terms are, CPI is cost per install, so what does it cost to get a user in your game? ARPU is average revenue per user, so that's like what's the average value of a user that you acquire in the game, usually in the geo that you acquire in. LTV is lifetime value, it's a fancier way to do a calculation of an ARPU. Anyway, <clears throat> long story short, uh, you'd acquire a user on Google Play and it wouldn't be worth what you spent for it. But you'd get those organic installed, and what would happen is, let's say you lost 25 cents or 50 cents on the user, the value of the organics made up for that and then also generated profit, which was awesome. This is what it looks like now on the Google Play Store. So the paid to organic ratio is broken. Uh, so no longer can you go out and spend on marketing and, and expect to get organic installs, just kind of pepper it in throughout. You can still get organics, they just come in a different way. We'll talk about that later. Um, and 
any revenue that you're seeing on your title, uh, at least for, for new launches and for a long time on those new launches, is being driven heavily by ads. So users that are acquired through marketing campaigns um, to find out about your game. I think if anyone's launched a game recently, you know, the last few years, you've probably noticed on Google Play uh, that organic installs are really hard to come by. Um, and this talks about why that is and also how to, how to come by them again. So what are you supposed to do? Um, one, you gotta get over the fact that the good old days are behind us. Um, you know, it was a little bit painful for me. I had an entire business model that was based on the old way. Um, so what would happen is a developer would have a game that was mostly done. We would launch it, get KPIs um, that would allow us, to, that would allow me in particular to make the argument that certain metrics needed to be improved. We'd improve those metrics over time as we were marketing. So I'd continue to market the game. We generate profit from the organic users that were driven. We'd split, we'd split that profit uh, and continue to build and grow the game over time. It was great because I was compensated for my work, and so was the developer. As we marketed, can't do that anymore. <clears throat> so now you need, as I like to call it, a fully baked casserole uh, before launching. So the game needs to be in really uh, good shape and advanced from a monetization KPI strategy and a retention KPI strategy standpoint before you launch. That's a picture from The Fly, great movie. So what do you need, uh, what do you need to do? Your monetization KPIs really need to be on point. Um, for the purposes of this presentation, I'm not gonna talk about um, ad ARPUs and ad revenue. Suffice it to say, if you have ads in your game, typically what I'm seeing is you know 13 to 15 cent ARPUs are common worldwide, I think it can get up to like 30 cents in the United States. If you're really optimizing and driving a bunch, you can probably do more than that. That's for non-forced ads um, that players are actually choosing to watch as opposed to um, ads that are getting forced on players. So those KPIs can be different depending on your approach. No judgment there. Uh, but this is focusing on monetization and conversion rate. So if you don't know, conversion rate is uh, for users that come in, how many of them are actually spending money? What percentage? Um, these are the, this is the new normal, at least it is for me. Um, so day zero, you know, you're looking for 1% or over, it's possible to do two or even more than two. Day 15, it's possible to do two, uh, three or more than three. And day 30, it's possible to do three or more than three. These are the targets. Um, it's doable. Um, the way that you do it requires a heck of a lot of work in terms of pricing um, and exposure of the in-app purchases. We spent a lot of time making sure that that monetization funnel is in place. But essentially, you want to be converting the highest number of users that you possibly can. The reason that you want this early conversion funnel in place <clears throat> is that these users are incredibly likely to do repeat spend. Right. So. Essentially what you want is to convert them early on and then present them with opportunities and options to, to monetize again and monetize more deeply at a higher price point. So this funnel is really important. It's increasingly important too to, to monetize as many of these users are, that are coming into the funnel because you don't have the luxury of a lot of organics trickling in to increase your revenue, uh, revenue streams anymore. So this is conversion rate. You really want to be converting the largest number of users possible. I'm not going to talk about the how here. This is mostly like what's the state of play and what you should be doing. If this is helpful for folks, I can go into some details on monetization strategy and approach here that, that we've used across the portfolio that's been successful. But these are real numbers that are really from the portfolio. This is a monthly cohort that we're looking at here. Um, I'm going to, the next slide is going to show a different game. So your KPIs continue, uh, need to be awesome continued. Uh, our poo poo is average revenue per paying user. So if they're paying, how much are they paying? Again, this is from a different game. So these price points are a little bit higher on this game and the conversion rates are a little bit lower, um, but it's possible to get something close to these our poo poos with the previous slide of conversion rate. Long story short, if you're getting people to spend, they need to be spending a decent amount of money. And that level of spend needs to be increasing over time. We discussed this previously, but basically what you're looking for here is you want early conversion and then you want repeat conversion and the repeat conversion needs to be at a higher price point, which is what this slide shows. Um, so 
yeah, it's totally possible to see a cohort mature like this um, over the first 30 days. Um, and as you'll see in, in the slides that are coming up, you want them to be converting, or you want them to be spending even more deeply over their lifetime in the game. That just means content and serving up a lot of content and also giving them lots of opportunities to have in-app purchases. Um, but these numbers are doable. We're doing them right now. You should totally be able to do them on your game. And it doesn't stop if the first 30 days. Uh, this is a good example of us having a game that's really focused on monetization up to three months out. Um, again, like you need to be mining any users that come into the game aggressively for revenue. That's the current state of play on the store, right? You, you cannot you cannot have a situation where a, a large number of users who have monetized have not been monetized optimally, right? You're gonna have to go out there and continue to sell things to that cohort so that you can afford to continue to acquire users to try and build towards some of the long-term object objectives that we're gonna be talking about in this presentation. So here, at day zero, it's like 22 bucks, awesome, right? Uh, at three months in, you want to be looking at a average revenue per paying user about 60. You can see here that we, we tap out around three months, right? So after that three months mark on this game, we're not really aggressively monetizing the users after that. And we, you can make the argument, I make the argument that we should be much more aggressive for the next three months, right? If we can do 62 in three months and it should be, you know, 120 or even more six months in. That requires like a long-term strategy and a lot of content, and a lot of things to purchase, but that's what your cohort should look like. They should be maturing over time. They should continue to spend over time. Pretty straightforward stuff. Next, we're gonna talk about retention. So, <clears throat> I, yeah, okay. Retention needs to be good, but some of the numbers that I see quoted uh, on retention kind of make me feel like I'm taking crazy pills. So, I think a lot of the numbers that get quoted um, on retention are coming from hyper-casual games and hyper-casual publishers. No knock on hyper casual, but like, you know, there's a lot of requirements to be able to hit 50% plus on your D1 retention. D1 is day one, right? So if you're curious, it's like how many people installed the game and then came back the next day to continue to play. It's doable, um, but I haven't done it. And I've had a very successful business not doing it. I think that when you hear from hyper casual publishers or anybody else in the space that D1 is a target, a 50% D1 rate is a target that you should be aspiring to, you should translate that mentally in your ear. And the translation is it's only worthwhile for us as a publishing team to push a bunch of our traffic towards you if you have a 50% D1, right? That's the unspoken part of that D1 retention analysis. That's what they're saying without explicitly saying it. The same thing is around user acquisition. It's only worth us turning on the jets and achieving the scale that's necessary and meaningful for our hyper-casual publishing business if you have a D1 of 50%, right? For the average Joe, for guys like me and indie developers um, and smaller developers, you know, you may not need the game to be generating hundreds of thousands of dollars of revenue over like a you know 10 day period or millions of dollars over a month that may not be a reasonable revenue estimate for you and that's totally fine um, it is important for those hyper casual publishers like the scale of their business necessitates that they hit those big revenue numbers and they hit those big revenue numbers they need to push big marketing and to push big marketing they need to have low cpis and those numbers those guys need to retain at a really high rate and they need to get absolutely hammered with ads in the game itself. So like take all that with a grain of salt. Um, most of the retention that I see on, on my side are these numbers. 36% uh, D1, 12% uh, D7, 4 to 5% D30. Those are good numbers, right? Am I going to retire on those numbers? No. Um, do I have the best retaining in games on the planet? Also no. Do I care? Not really. Like, I'm not trying to get to the scale of hyper-casual publishers. I think most people aren't trying to get those scales. It's a, sta it's, it's a standard that you should be very careful about holding yourself to. Um, there's a, you know, we could talk for days about the requirements that are necessary to get to that D1 retention, but um, that's not the purpose of this conversation. The purpose is to normalize normal retention numbers. These are very normal. 
Also, one disclaimer on retention, because I get asked about this a lot. I think this is a, it's not a failure, but it's, um, it's like a, mis it, it, it's a, it's something that people chase after that they can't realistically achieve. And that's trying to boost your retention, right? So a lot of people are like, hey, Mike, um, my D1 retention is really low, and I'm going to go on this quixotic journey to improve it. I'm like, please, God, don't, don't do that. The reason is it's incredibly hard to change your retention numbers. Much easier to change monetization numbers. Um, I don't think I've ever successfully really affected core retention um, on any title. Sure, you can move day one, but 7, 30, that's a much harder thing to do and it requires a full team. In my experience, retention is sending you a message and it's a signal. And that, that's a signal on the art style that you've chosen in combination with the genre that you're in in combination with your user acquisition strategy, in combination where, uh, with where you're getting your organics from. So an example of this is like a collectible card game. There's a finite number of users who are gonna be interested in a collectible card game, period. Um, you can try and influence that, you can try and change that, but as soon as people see cards, that's gonna be um, really motivational to a very small number of users, right? Your funnel is really tight. And it's gonna be off-putting to the vast majority of players out there. That doesn't mean you shouldn't make a collectible card game. It just means that you shouldn't die on the retention hill trying to improve that, right? Let's, let's imagine, the, re the way that this translates to retention is if you go out and do a user acquisition campaign and you're like, oh man, this creative is just like bananas. We're getting all these great users in and then that cohort is just bouncing on day one, well, it just means you have really good marketing creative and you're attracting people outside of the bubble that are interested in collectible card games. That's all that means. It doesn't necessarily mean that you've, you know, like cracked some recipe here. It just means that people who otherwise wouldn't give your game a chance gave it a chance and they don't like the game. That's fine. Same with art style, right? There's some art styles that resonate with people and some art styles that don't. I like pixel art, I think it's nostalgic, it appeals to guys that look like me. I think, you know, it looks old um, to younger generations, but I'm, I'm fine with it. It's, a, it's targeting a very specific demographic in a very specific set of countries that I feel comfortable with. I know what the CPIs are, I know what the CTRs are, the click-through rates, and I know what the conversion rates are, um, which is the number of users that actually turn into players. So like, I'm comfortable with that art style and I think it's an important part of our approach to user acquisition. You know, I've also had situations where we've had an influx of users from countries um, that may not particularly like the genre or style of game that you're putting forward, either organically or from user acquisition sources and then you see your retention tank and then the developer's like, oh, something's broken or I did something wrong. No, it's the sources that you're getting your traffic from, right? So if you get a bunch of traffic from a geo that may not be into your style of game, your retention is going to suffer. And if you make inferences about the overall retention of your game and whether or not something's broken based on traffic sources, that's problematic too because it's giving you a false negative signal. Anyway, uh, that's that's my long rant on retention. I think you know obviously you got to apply a grain of salt to this. If you find yourself in a situation where your retention looks significantly worse than previous games you put out in that genre or other competitive games in that genre, then you've got bugs or you've got problems with your tutorial or your game may have like some inherent balance and tuning progression issues built in there. You should take those seriously, um, but it also probably isn't worth fixing it because the effort that goes into fixing retention is pretty much equivalent to the ex effort required to build a whole new game, at least in my experience. All right, so let's get to the, the fun part here, and this is going to be the last slide for today, and there's going to be a lot of detail on this one. So how do you get organic installs today? Um, so number one, the easiest way to do it is you can have a title that was out in 2020 um, that is grandfathered in, right? <clears throat> so as far as I can tell, again, this is my, my subjective opinion, but what I'm seeing <coughs> is that titles that have launched prior to the um, 2021 cutoff date have grandfathered in a paid to organic ratio that is unchanged. It's, I think, why you see so much stagnation on the Google Play Store now. Um, 
the former winners are still the winners and the new losers are the losers, right? And except for rare exceptions like Monopoly Millionaires, which seems to be having unlimited marketing budget, right? They can't really form any opinions about that. Um, I think there are a lot of people out there who are going to give you their hot takes on new genres. And essentially what they're telling you is like these guys are spending a lot on marketing. What they're not telling you is you don't know what their profitability looks like. And I wouldn't want to hazard a guess towards the payback window of those marketing campaigns or the scale of their marketing budget, other than I'm sure they're eye-popping. So long story short here, um, if you have an older game, and I have a bunch of older games in the portfolio, they still look pretty healthy from a paid to organic ratio standpoint, which is very unusual. I, I think that's there's probably some logic there on the on the Android and the Google Play side. I wouldn't hazard a guess as to what that logic is, but it exists. Number two, uh, you can, so all the KPIs that we talked about before, these are what I categorize as mystery KPIs. Google's never gonna tell you what the algorithm is looking at. Um, I've asked, <laughs> and they didn't tell me. Um, so what you have to do is think about it from their position. If you were running the Google Play Store, what do you think would matter, right? Use common sense. Um, I think if I were running the Google Play Store, the things that would matter is I wouldn't want a game that's crashing and freezing all the time. So crashes and ANRs need to be in the good behavior threshold, which is relatively easy to do. The previous KPIs that we talked about, like retention KPIs, you wouldn't want a game that's just hemorrhaging users from a retention standpoint, um, at least relative to other games in your category. They don't provide retention stats on, on the dev console for Google Play. So you're going to have to do your best to figure out what that looks like on your own. Um, but some of the retention KPIs there, I think, are, are good, good proxies. Uh, the monetization KPIs that we talked about, I think, will put you in good standing, right? I can't, I, obviously nobody knows what KPIs they're ranking on, but if I were running the Google Play Store, I'd care about money, right? Like, think about it from their perspective. I could give 1,000 installs to Clash of Clans, which has a payback window, which has a revenue of X for us, right? Which is probably pretty lucrative for the Google Play Store. Or I could give it to this new unproven game that is generating Y revenue, and Y revenue is significantly less than X revenue. I mean, I know what I would do in that situation. Give it to Clash. I think that's what Google is doing. If you want to get a hold of some of those organic KPIs, then you need to show them that you're worth it that you're competitive with some of the bigger dogs out there on a revenue basis. So that's number two. Some of these mystery KPIs matter, right? Like crashes and A&Rs, rating. I think they put a lot of emphasis on those things, but you know, I've seen games that have done well from a financial perspective at 4.0 and below. Um, I've seen games that have done well from a financial perspective that have crashed a lot. Um, I haven't seen games that have done well from a financial perspective recently that aren't making a lot of money per user. So I'd keep that in mind. The other thing that Google seems to have built in here, and I'm seeing this firsthand, are these download uh, thresholds. So when you go to the Google Play Store and you look up uh, the number of downloads that um, a game has gotten, there's these little tags, right? Like this game has 100 downloads and it has this many ratings, and this is, this is the rating that it has. This game has got 10,000 downloads, right? Now, each of those thresholds is like a little gate that you can pass through, and when you pass through it, you get a little spurt of organic installs, at least at the start, right? Pass 100, Google takes a little bit of notice. They're like, hey, you seem to be doing some user acquisition, driving value on our platform. We want to reward that with a little bit of organic traffic. Cool. 500, a little bit more, right? Implicit in this idea of passing <laughs> Uh, these install thresholds is that you're, gain, you're making rational decisions as a developer to engage in user acquisition that is driving value um, to your game, right? So you're not losing money on this spend. And I think that's a really important kind of assumption. Again, I'm not sure if it's true, but I think it's true on the Google Play side. They're like, well, if you're spending, it means it's worth spending it which means it's worth for us to give you some traffic too, provided these other mystery KPIs are hitting the levels that they want to see. God knows what they are. What I've seen is, you know, at 1,000 and 5,000, more organic traffic comes in. 10,000, more, right? Not enough to carry you from one of these thresholds to another, right? 
That's very important to keep in mind. None of these thresholds in and of themselves are good enough to generate enough organic installs to make that much of a difference um, to get to the next milestone. So if you pass 10,000, you're not gonna get 40,000 organics. You'll get a few thousand. The key milestones that I've seen recently are at the 50 and 100,000 thresholds. You hit 50, now Google is starting to take you a little bit more seriously. Like, this, guy's, this guy means business, right? Let's splash some more traffic on him, right? You hit 100, even more. The challenge here is that the as you get further down uh, this tag system here, uh, you need more installs to get to the next milestone, right? So the, when if you go back to what I was talking about previously about the necessity of launching a fully baked casserole or a game that has its KPIs in the best state possible, the reason why is you're going to go through um, times of plenty right and then really lean times from an organic install standpoint 50 to 100 like you're going to get a lot of organic installs because those are relatively close together it's big enough that google's going to push getting from you know let's say after 100 is done you've got 200,000 installs right some some combination there of organic installs that you've gotten from the google play store and your own marketing right that's it right it shuts off it's not perpetual the way it used to be in the past so now you're at this spot where you're you're essentially marooned at 200,000 installs and you need to get to 500 in the distance that's a lot of user acquisition that's a lot of budget and it's a lot of time right so if you're you're gonna have to eat dog food on every one of those installs to get to 500 to get theoretically to more organics I'm not sure in the current state of uh, Google Play whether or not 500 yields more organics. When I pass it on some of the newer games I'm working on, I'll come back here and tell you, but I'm not sure. Um, but I want to get there and I want to find out. The only way to get there without losing your shirt is that you need to be generating profit on each of those users, which means you need to be in the pits, like fighting it out on ROI, return on investment, or return on ad spend, ROAS, for every one of those users that you're acquiring on the way to 500, right? It also influences how you're using the money that you're generating from the game, right? If you know that you got lots of margin around 50 and 100,000 installs and you're not likely to see any margin again until 500, you need to do some shrewd planning because you're about to go through some really lean times to get to 500, depending on the CPI of your game you're gonna be living off the profit that you can actually generate on that game itself to get to 500. I, what I think in broad strokes, the big changes that I've seen here is that margins have really been pinched and the qualifications that are required to generate support from these platforms have gone through the roof. We haven't even talked about Apple. And I, I really won't. I think it's extraordinarily hard these days to do uh, any successful um, marketing and user acquisition on Apple. I'm sure there are people out there who would tell you otherwise, and they may be right. But my experience is that it's if this is hard, Apple is exponentially harder. Um, so the reality here is like margins have really, really been shrunk, and you need to launch a game that's really focused on monetization. You know, there was a time in the past where I would talk to developers and they would come to me and they'd be a little squeamish about conversion rates and average revenue per paying user and over monetizing and they think that they get some benefits or some dividends um, from the community, right? Like community goodwill uh, for not monetizing that audience heavily. Um, at the time I told them, you get nothing for it, right? If you give something to somebody for free who's a player, then the player just takes the free thing. That's it, there's no exchange there. You don't get anything in return. The player got something and that's it. It's a one-sided transaction. Um, now more than ever, and I, I used to emphasize like you, as much as possible you need to monetize cohorts of users, right? They're enjoying your game. The vast majority of players are enjoying your game for free. Um, so if it's you're monetizing, you need to do it aggressively and you need to be unapologetic about it. I think now more than ever, 
you have to do it aggressively and be unapologetic about it. And you also need to not lose money on your marketing campaigns. Um, that, that's a whole different presentation on approach um, and, and thinking on marketing and user acquisition in the current environment, particularly for small and mid-sized developers. Big developers don't, you know, they'll figure it out. They'll go spend gobs of cash and they'll have a payback window of multiple years. I don't particularly think that's a great idea, but do what you're gonna do, right? Um, I think for regular people uh, who have reasonable budgets and an expectation of a payback window and a risk tolerance that's not through the roof, you gotta be extraordinarily careful with the way that you're deploying your marketing dollars across uh, your campaigns. I'd be happy to talk about that in a future presentation. Anyway, I hope this gives people a pretty good idea of what's required um, from a table stakes perspective to have any kind of organic success on um, on the Google Play Marketplace these days. Again, this is for free-to-play games. Um, if you're a premium game on the on the Google Play Marketplace, I don't have much exposure there, but I, I don't. I think that's an incredibly difficult proposition um, in in the current environment. I think it always was. So this is just focused for free-to-play on Android games that are generating revenue from in-app purchases um, and a little bit from ads too. Hope this was helpful. If it is, throw a comment and like and all the other nonsense that they ask you to do on social media, right? Like, follow, subscribe. Totally up to you. You don't have to do any of those things. If you enjoyed it, uh, shoot me an email. I'll put that in the comments below.